be it, like the uh, black and white inner dialogue? Or? Okay, so, so some of the conversation is where we're going to go from here to do an interracial dialogue. What's that? Night, you know? the, the, that's part of the, the, hopefully we will have time at the end of this conversation to discuss where people want to go from here. And I have ideas, but I'm sure everyone else does too. Um, interracial dialogue is very, very powerful, but it requires um, commitment from a group of people and it's, it's very uh, or logistically intensive, right? Because you want to make sure that you're, uh, unlike the, our conversation, a dialogue would mean understanding what are the parameters of a dialogue, um, following exercises where people have equal times to speak. There, there's a lot that goes into organizing a dialogue. Um, so I am more inclined to say if people are interested in doing that, the JCRC would, or, and I would work with them to identify um, how to move forward on that. I don't think I have the bandwidth. I could do one, we could do one dialogue, um, but if, if we want to do this in a way that we spin it off to different communities to run dialogues, maybe we'll want to bring together people for a training on how to run them and have people run them. Um, we, we can talk about what, what people think they have the bandwidth to do and what we can do well. Um, I want to be sure that we talk about what we're going to do. If, if we want to do a dialogue, what do we want to do until that gets started? What do we want to do amongst ourselves while we um, work on how to, I always feel old when I use this language, but how do we, how do we work on proximity? What, what are the ways in which we can engage um, people of color appropriately without making it the role of people of color? And here I'm switching deliberately from black into people of color. Um, they are not responsible for who are quarter colorless, right? For, for engaging racial justice. Like this is not something that we have to wait till black people tell us how to do it before we have to take responsibility for acting and being engaged in issues of racial justice. Um, and, I, and I think we need to understand what is our role going forward um, without making it someone else's problem. And I think there are a, there are a lot of people who feel like they, they, they don't know how to take those first steps appropriately. So we want to talk about that as well. Right, and next week we also want to, I mean, we seem to be starting a little bit here. And next week we also are we're going to have a chance to talk with um, Chad Lassiter, who's the Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission. And I want to encourage people to think through what questions you want to ask him or what you want him to prepare. I'm sorry, Panina, what were you saying? next it's next week as well next well next week is a conversation with chad lassiter yes so it was three sessions of conversations amongst ourselves hi mark and then it was uh, a session with chad hi Arlene. good morning i mean it's not morning good evening oh that doesn't bode well i don't believe okay. it but i am sitting in a traffic jam. Oh, good. You'll have more time to focus as our conversation. Robin, do you want to reflect on that for the group or do you want to just wait and have a conversation? Um, so I just private messaged Bacha and ADL has a Black Jewish Alliance that is actively um, working on projects that bring um, Black people and Jewish people together as individuals and as, you know, larger community representatives to build bridges. And um, I just text, I just sent her a message like, where the group is meeting again, we have another meeting next week, but we're, um, we're, we're actively trying to think of what we can do during this time virtually. And so I, you know, I can 
talked about you offline about some of the brainstorming we've been doing and maybe there's something we can do collaboratively. Okay. And we can certainly, if people have ideas they want, to, they want to follow through on, we can certainly arrange opportunities to have conversations and talk through individual ideas. We're not going to be able to do everything during these three or four conversations. Right? We understand these are just the beginning of, of understanding our own identities and our own sense of how we want to approach this. But this is just the beginning of a conversation, not the totality of the conversation. Was there any talk about having some kind of uh, statement reaction to what happened in Minneapolis, in Minnesota? From this group? Or JCRC or whatever, or ADL? I mean, is there any, is there any official reaction coming? I would guess that ADL National has reacted. I honestly have been in meetings all day long today and not off of my Zoom at all. I'm sure we reacted, but I don't have the details, but I can send that Again, to Bachi, I'll write myself a note. Um, I'm sure that something came out from Jonathan and from that region and from that area. And I, I can say very clearly, Re Rebecca Krasner, who represents BZBI officially on these phone calls, as does David. Um, Rebecca's talking, talked about wanting to uh, explore next steps for a synagogue group. So an easy way to start that if they wanted, if the shul wanted to, is to explore a Facebook group a place where people could post events and have some of these conversations. But I can talk that through with Rebecca. Um, I want to start with thank yous, actually, because when we get to the end of the conversation, there's, there's been a lot that's happened. So I want to take a moment to thank ever so many people who have made these conversations possible. So that way I don't get to the end and forget you all. all right. So uh, first of all, let me thank David, Jason Holtzman who is the JCRC's program officer and has been our um, tech support in person for a lot of these phone calls and whose support and efforts have been invaluable. David Haas, who is communications, hi David, is the communications director or something like that for BZBI, who has done a lot of the logistical work to get these online. David, what's your title? A communications coordinator. Oh, I was so close. And he has communications in his email address, which is how I know. Rebecca, what's your official title? I'm a community engagement specialist. All right. So Rebecca and, and Rebecca and David made it possible to collaborate with BZBI, and they will make it possible to move forward as a community. Um, and again, I know there are a number of people who have been on these calls from Germantown Jewish Center. I'm talking to um, Rabbi Zeph as well. Um, right, this, these are the beginning of conversations and outreach into the community. Uh, thank you to Lindsay Weicker. Did I pronounce your last name right, Lindsay? Close enough. Who is the, um, what's your title, Lindsay? I'm the uh, manager for data analytics in the evaluation research and knowledge management department of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. Right, so Lindsay is my colleague who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the numbers as the Jewish Federation has just completed its population study. So we're grateful for her to be here today who can give us some actual hard numbers with regard to Jews of color and uh, Jews of color adjacent. I don't know, She'll, she'll explain it all. Um, Arlene Fickler, who should be thanked at all times for everything is the JCRC chair who makes everything possible. Um, I don't know if Dan Siegel is there, but I see Sheila Siegel. And Sheila and Dan are, um, Dan is the past chair of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And uh, Dan and Sheila also have been very dedicated and committed moving forward for this work. We were on the mission together along, along with a number of other people to the, the civil rights mission. And afterwards, I was able to go with Dan and Sheila for a busman's holiday. We went on to uh, Memphis, where we visited the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. Um, thank you to Les and Eve Robbins. And um, 
Jasmine and Akil Bowler and Jared Jackson, who have all agree, agreed to, to try at least to participate this evening to talk about their experiences of being Jews of color as part of the BZVI community and the Philadelphia community. Uh, Jared has, has a number of things on his schedule, so he's going to be joining us um, at 7.30. He is the executive director of Jews in All Cues. Did I forget anybody? And I, you know, let me also say thank you all for participating. It's, um, it's an important conversation and I am really very pleased and, and We lost about you. Okay. Okay. You took the host back, David. Oh, it was not my intention. I'm trying to call her. Okay. I have to imagine she's logging back in. I'll call her right now. Everybody else is still there. We're missing you. Yes, her Zoom is loading. You're going to share it on. Share it with Dave. Share it with Jason. Okay. Jason, she's sharing a document with you that we can then begin to discuss. Okay. But yeah, I put you on this speaker. I don't know if you can be heard by the others merely by transmission or not. Okay. I'm trying to share a document with Jason. Jason. Can you go yeah. into the documents and get things? Wait. Go into where? In my Google Docs. I'm looking. All right, let me, I'm going to go onto my phone. Goodbye. Hold on. Oh. I don't, you know, we all think these, the, the Zoom work is very nice when it works. But when it doesn't, God help us all. <laughs> That's the truth. Usually when Zoom goes down for a BZBI event, um, somewhere where there's no cell phone reception and can't help at all. So you just never know. At least we've been, you know, doing well until now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, just a little bump in the road. You know, there's a certain irony that Bhatia decided not to share the documents for tonight in advance because last week we had so much trouble with sharing them in advance that we ended up putting them on the screen. And so she decided to follow that same process again tonight. And now we've lost her and the documents. We had the documents, so at least we could begin to review them. I think she just sent me the documents. Arlene. The answer yeah. is you got to take the belt and suspenders approach. I think that's exactly <laughs> right. Be ready to share it on the Zoom. Did you get it, Jason? Yeah, I'm putting it on the screen right now. Okay.
Can we see it? We can. Do we want to start reading this as a group? Yes, do we have a volunteer? I can volunteer. I'm happy to start. Go ahead, Jason. Okay. Uh, it's from Facebook and it's called An Experience of a Jew of Color from Maraged, and it was December 20th, 2019. Friends, with another Shabbat about to begin, I'd like to share some thoughts, as I promised I would, about how I'm feeling after my final speaking engagement of 2019. This is going to be a long post, so please settle in if you choose to read it. Obviously, I hope that you will. For those of you who are not aware, one week ago, I arrived at the Union for Reform Judaism Biennial Conference in Chicago, and from moment one, things did not go as any of us had hoped they would. When I went to pick up my credentials, I was told that the quote, real Maraged needed to pick up her badge. And when I replied that I was the real Maraged, I did not receive an apology. Instead, the person behind the desk said, really? When I was eventually given my very bright orange badge that clearly said presenter across the bottom, I was assumed to be hotel staff, twice, while wearing my bright orange badge and told that I needed to do more to get room service orders out more quickly. I was aggressively asked repeatedly, what are you doing here? And when I would reply that I was a featured speaker on Shabbat afternoon, I was then asked what I could possibly have to speak about. I ended up in an elevator filled with attendees who elected to whisper about me, what I was doing there, and again, what I could possibly be presenting about, like I wasn't there, stared at, confronted, whispered about, and assumed to work for the hotel. It all grew so uncomfortable for me to be out with the general population that I had to be escorted from place to place by URJ staff, to whom I am profoundly grateful, who saw for themselves the looks that I received simply being in the hallways. When others were at Shabbat services or dinner or song session, I was in my hotel room alone, crying, because I did not want to feel comfortable and safe being out with my own people. I shared these stories during my session, and while most people asked very thoughtful questions were and were empathetic and supportive, uh, where did the rest of it go? I can probably find the post somewhere. Perhaps Bhatia intentionally left the balance off so that we could engage in our own reactions yeah, to that story. Sense. People have reactions. Were, were people aware of, of this? Um, of this posting when it happened after the RA, after the convention of uh, the reform convention? Uh, I was to say, I, I, I did read this sometime after the convention uh, a couple months ago and um, found it, you know, very painful. Um, and uh, and yet not not very surprising because I've heard uh, similar stories from others as well that even you know the, the best intentioned of us um, can have blind spots. Well, it it just um, yes, but it seems cool. You know, to speak about somebody who's right there in the elevator with you um, as if she were not a human being, you know, with feelings. Um, it's somehow more than a blind spot. Mm -hmm. Bhatia, you, you're muted. You're back. I, I am sort of back. I am now on my cell phone while my computer tries to be useful. <laughs> um, yeah. 
but at least we'll we can kind of make do with that for so now. in your in your absence batia we, jason read the um post uh from the woman who part was at the reform convention and was treated badly to put it politely um, and we assume that you ended it where intentionally where she's where she's beginning to describe the reactions to her presentation um so at, at this point i mean you, you can actually go friend her on facebook and it's listed there she also has a recent article out at tablet on tablet magazine which is um has even a little bit less of a description um it may be helpful to know that rick jacobs apologized so mm -hmm. i've had interesting reactions to this piece um but before i talk about them i'd love to hear some of your reactions it was, was it surprising um how when you reflect on this experience what is it that you think about it yeah so before you always... returned david mazenkas said that um he did not find it surprising although disappointing and she and sheila Eagles found it to be cruel. Yeah, the description in the elevator. Yeah, yeah I'm talking. Yeah. talking. Yeah. Sorry, I, I just, you know, because I'm on my cell phone, I can only see one little square at a time. <laughs> and it's a little crazy making. Um, so I'm still trying to get back on. Okay. Um, Leslie. Well, well, I had read it before, uh -huh. and I think, you know, there are so many people who aren't used to seeing Black or other people of color in Jewish spaces, um, even though, you know, you might think everyone wants to think that you're very inclusive and welcoming. Uh, it's just, it's very sad. Well. Less. Yeah, it, it's you know this kind of stuff is not uh, unusual. It seems um, the fact that they don't see a lot of people of color in in their in their space typically is no excuse. Um, it's a matter of how do you treat people as people. Period. Um, it's disrespectful. It's dishonoring, and um, it's not unusual. I found it to be um, disheartening in terms of thinking about raising black children and then potentially facing this. Well, it's one of the things as a black you have to get used to. It, it's not only the Jewish community, it happens you know, everywhere. And so you, you either, you have to steal yourself and, and be aware of it and and just deal and um shouldn't, shouldn't. To, to the extent that it's closer to home and in a community where you're supposed to feel safe it may hurt a little more but it's not yeah it's not something that you're surprised by i would say differently than having to get used to it you you become numb to it so i wouldn't say i got i, I get used to it okay um i think about this in what synagogues my children will go to, um, what schools they will attend, um, even what's happening, what, as someone mentioned, what's happening right now in the current climate or yesterday or February or every single day. It's not a feeling of I'm used to it. Right. More, I feel, think it's more numbing than normal. Right. right. Well, that's why what you said about, you know, choosing synagogues, choosing schools, you know, it, it's important uh, because every institution has a personality. And, uh, you know, that, you know, and those can evolve, but, you know, it, it, it is good to-, to And to some extent, we get to choose the bubble we live in. Right. You know, as a reformed Jew, as somebody who's been to many of these biennials, 
it's extremely disappointing. It points out between the espouse theory of the reform movement and like the theory in action, what they say they believe or what we say we believe and then what happens on the ground. Um, the, the, I, I've been to the biennials. Biennials have speakers of color all the time. They, and, uh, but they're very small. They are a very small minority of attendees of these biennials. And, uh, you know, for me, the question is a movement that writes about Jews of color has, you know, posting on its web pages about Jews of color. And then this happens it's, as it's at its biennial. How in the heck does it happen? How do you make change on the ground so that what the top of the leadership is saying filters down to the people like attending the biennial? I'm, I'm really, I'm sad and horrified by, by it, by this post. Oh. Yeah, Arlene, I was going to say, as someone who works in a synagogue community um, whose, you know, whole job is about community and welcoming, um, it's such a challenge to change the culture of an institution, let alone an entire movement. Um, when I first read this, I have to admit that I was so surprised that it was from the reform movement because, because of because of the the founding tenets of of the reform movement um but it's you know we have no control over what our what the the people in our institutions are going to say and what they're what they're going to do um but i'm really grateful to baya for bringing this because it really helps us to open up a very specific conversation about what can we be doing in our communities to try to um, understand what it feels like to be a person of color within our primarily majority white um, synagogues, other community gatherings, you know, that specific conversation of how do you welcome, how do you try to um, be a change agent within your within your smaller community. Because I just want to add that I, I think that the experience should be kind of embraced because it really points out that regardless of what tenets are put out by an organization, the organization still functions within American society. Right. American society, as much as we want to think it's the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths, it's not so. And therefore, you have this as an experience to put it squarely in front of you that this country, the way that it operates, the way that the assumptions that are held, the values that are held, are very contradict contradictory. And it also suggests the real need for actually having people of color, if, if there's a desire for change, to put those faces into different types of positions, forward-facing positions, so that it becomes more normative. I mean, I think there are just a whole host of assumptions that people have I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been mistaken for the help you know, in different places that I go. It happens all the time. If, you know, you, you do have to steel yourself to it. But I think in this instance, because it happened in this very confined environment of the biennial, it really affords an opportunity to see something that you might not ordinarily see and to recognize um, solutions that really would start with not understanding how somebody feels, but understanding what can be done about it in terms of making it more usual for people to see people of color in leadership. I think about the, the rabbi at Central Synagogue. She is a fantastic um, symbol because people see her and they see her as a non-white person who is in that position and she was the cantor before that. So um, that's just my thought. Mm -hmm. I think something that's also interesting too is <laughs> it's up to everyone to look inward as well to think that one space because everybody is the the same that it's not it doesn't exist there right um like you were saying is a, is a mirror to the world it is very much the same and if people are not willing to have conversations i actually just saw a post um with a, somebody was wearing something that said it is the darkest among us who experienced the most racism across the world Right, so that's everyone. And if you are not expecting to see someone, you can have a conversation about where they should be or shouldn't be. But it's also a, the a looking inward. I think part of it too is us is people not addressing 
their own racism or racism within a group to each other, right? We always want to quietly address that person, afterwards address that person, but not addressing it out loud in front of people um, across levels, then I think that becomes an issue too, because everybody wants to say, well, let's talk about what happened. Or a lot of people, it seems like, I, don't, I didn't see the whole post, a lot of people came to support her, but who came to challenge those who were making those comments, right? Are we challenging them on a platform so everyone learns that this is a, 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 an issue? Are we challenging them at the highest level? I mean, it, like um, uh, Rebecca said, it is hard to change a culture, but if you're not willing to go outside of your norm or be, uh, you know, I guess a rabble rouser of any sort, then you can't change a culture. You pay a price when you try to ch uh, change the culture. I was saying Kaddish for my father, and I heard at, at a synagogue that was not mine, and I, I didn't hear the word, the N word used, but in Yiddish, I heard the S word used. And um, I, I, you know, I figured, you know, you want to be part, you want to be accepted as part of the group. You don't want to say to somebody, that's a, that's a terrible thing. Stop using that word. I'm a, it's offensive, blah, blah, blah. And finally, I did. I, I, I kind of blew up at the guy. And, but the price you pay is the risk of, of, of being like put out of the group, so, so to speak. I'm not saying that I shouldn't have challenged him. I'm glad I challenged him. To this moment, I'm glad I challenged him. But then people say, oh, exactly. You're a robber rouser. You're a troublemaker. You know, why can't you just get along? I mean, right, so, I'm not, yeah. So I want to first, I want to once again apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, as my computer refuses to connect to the internet, I am now on my iPad. Oh my so God. we are, which is not nearly so efficient in some ways. So we will muddle through. Um, I want to clarify, I am not Jason Holtzman. Jason Holtzman is not having an identity crisis. Um, I am just labeled as Jason Holtzman. And Jared Jackson of um, uh, Jews in All Hues is also not Jason Holtzman. Um, and we are, we are uh, Jared managed to, to find some time to schedule this evening. I want him to please have the opportunity to talk uh, for a few minutes. Uh, David Haas, please make Jason Holtzman um, a host of this meeting so he can handle some of these technical issues, God willing. Um, Jared, if you could share um, why you founded Jews in, on, on, in All Hues, why you're doing the work you're doing, and what you want to be sure that people have a chance to address in this conversation. You're on mute right now. I had planned to share your Facebook page so that everyone would see the Jews in All Hues Facebook page, but that's just not working. So you'll have to muddle through. Ladies and gentlemen, Jared Jackson. No drum roll? Sorry. No. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Jackson. I'm the founder and executive director of Jews and All Hues. We're local to Philadelphia, um, but we're a national organization. Um, a little bit about me. I grew up in South Jersey, but I was born in Philly, in Mount Airy. Um, uh, and I grew up experiencing a lot of uh, a lot of racism. Sorry, you're also going to hear my kid in the background because this is 2020. Um, so it's also bedtime. Um, so I grew up in South Jersey, facing a lot of anti-Semitism, uh, full frontal, like our house being broken into because they thought that we were rich or my my friends trying to friends my classmates trying to uh, like stone me to death because their preacher said you know the jew the jew blah, blah, blah. i can't say too much because my kid is around um and i also faced a lot of racism in the jewish community so much so i only spent one year of hebrew school in in the synagogue um before it was too too much for my family to bear and we also um, tried many other places, many other streams of Judaism and were rejected for the same reason. The fact that we are like black and brown kids and my mom is a widow. 
Um, so there were, there were a lot of intersections there. Um, but the, one of the main points is like, that actually led up to me um, founding Jews and All Hughes is the fact that in my house, um, there was a lot of love. There was a lot of love for Judaism, Jewish people, like uh, Jewish peoplehood, uh, I meant to say, um, humanistic values. My mom spent a, a lot of years of, of her youth uh, growing up on a kibbutz, not growing up, but like growing up in, in the adult sense. Um, on a kibbutz and, and uh, really love connecting with various people around, around Israel and um, also in New York where she grew up. So um, she passed a lot of that down to us. If there were also different families when I was growing up who were just like mine, um, who also faced rejection. Um, and Growing up, growing up in South Jersey is not the simplest thing to do. Um, uh, growing up anywhere is really simple. Growing up isn't simple. Uh, but when I became an adult, I got more and more curious about actual like Judaism outside the home, um, more than just Passover seder's and Hanukkah and uh, you know guilt trips. So I, um, I did some exploring. I, I ended up uh, becoming the president of a Hillel. Uh, ended up working for Birthright Israel, and it was at Birthright Israel that, um, it, it, well, right before I started there, um, connected to Birthright Israel was this trip that I was selected to be on, and there were fifteen people selected throughout the world uh, to be on this trip for people who made a significant impact in their local Jewish community. And uh, on that trip, there were people who had one Jewish parent. Um, so, some people were, were adoptees, just by choice and all, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of us had the same thread going through where it, we were leading in communities um, that didn't fully accept us. You okay, Anne? Excuse me. Um, um, and, and uh, you know, there was, there was one conversation I had with somebody who also grew up in the United States, who grew up in Texas, and uh, she, she's receiving the same award trip as, as I, and um, you know, her, her stories about not being accepted were just as insane as mine. Um, and, and so, you know, it was a combination of like facing all this adversity while, uh, while loving Judaism that kind of created a, a cocktail that ended up forming Jews in all hues. Um, and really the, the point is, is that, you know, we started out as a, as a, um, as a group of former, uh, formerly enslaved peoples that began a new, vibrant uh, religious tradition and cult and multiple cultures that uh, have spanned thousands of years, and in being in the United States, we are we have been enveloped in into white supremacy, uh, which tells us that those of us who are anything but, uh, or even mixed into, are not valid, are not um, worthy of being in Jewish community, and that is complete BS. Um, and so one of the, the goal of Jews and all Hughes is to make intersectional diversity normative. Uh, the goal of Jews and all Hughes is to, to build a future where all of our, sorry, <laughs> this is Johnny Johnny, um, where all of our people can, with safety and uh, CDC approval, congregate. Um, where where somebody can walk in to a synagogue, walk in and, and say Kaddish for their for their parents, or or um, 
celebrate anything and celebrate who they are, the community will celebrate them. Um, this is a time of both and the cutting. My kid knows how to use Zoom. Um, this is at a time of, of cutting off people. Um, this, is, this is really a time where we can have a full accounting of who the Jewish community is and celebrate that and, and know that in, in celebrating who we are, um, we will build a better future for everybody who is involved in the Jewish community, not just not just Jews, but like some of our parents, some of our loved ones, some of our kids, you know, um, uh, that, that looks totally different than the 1950s and is much better for us as human beings. And so from that point, we can also be a model to, uh, <clears throat> to other communities who are struggling with the same things and to this country that is definitely struggling with uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and one of, the, one of the major things that we do is diversity, equity, inclusion, consulting and training, uh, which I've also been doing through the pandemic. Um, we have a whole team, a whole multiracial inter intersectional team um, that that takes on various issues, but really has uh, a grounding in uh, pro-liberation uh, strategies and mo modalities um, that are based in like anti-racism work and anti-oppression work. So, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure how much longer I can stay on, but um, I, I'm, really happy to be invited uh, here to speak and to share a little bit about Jews and all hues. Um, you know, I'm sure, um, hold on kiddo, hold on. Uh, I'm sure uh, Rabbi Batia or is it Rabbi Jason Holtzman? No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, Think about the student loans you say, Jason. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure the uh, my information can be shared. Um, if, any, if anybody wants to get in contact with me, um, I, I've seen some of your faces before, uh, so I I am happy to see you. Um, others I've, I've never seen before, and I really hope to connect um, uh, because our. Our way forward is uh, like not to be so cliche, but our way forward is together. But we can't be together unless we actually know who we are, um, and that means counting every single one of us, and all of our, all of our partners from other religious traditions, etc., and marching forward and helping to defeat a, a whole series of pressures that coincide with um, or are involved in part of. Uh, white supremacy. Thank you so much, Jared. That was beautiful. Mm. Thank you for sharing and thank you for setting us up for our transition into the population study discussion so beautifully. <laughs> thank you. All right. Say Lala Tov, Lala. Lala Tov. Lala Tov. Bye bye. So, um, this week there was a series of articles and responses. To, a, to an article about a population study challenging a study that said that the percentage of Jews of color in the United States was between 12 and 15%. And since I cannot share this document with you on screen, um, I will just read you the first line of a sign-on letter in response to the initial article and we can send you all these links tomorrow i didn't want to send them in advance because it seemed they seem too many things in advance seemed kind of overwhelming so we can send them tomorrow and you can decide whether you want to open them or not but the first response line in the response was we the undersigned believe that all jewish people of color count 
and deserve to be treated with dignity. Don't forget to fill out the census form and vote, by the way. Um, and in Philadelphia, we have, the Jewish Federation has recently completed a population study of uh, the entire five county region. And Lindsay has agreed to talk about the number, how those numbers reflect the Jewish Jews of color in this area, how those questions were designed, um, and what they tell us, and to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here with us this evening, Lindsay. Thanks so much for having me, Batya. Um, I am going to share real Okay, I'm not able to share my screen, so we're just going to talk you, a little bit. If you, um, if you can send it to Jason, he can share. It's fine. I, it's just a couple of charts, but we could talk through it. Um, so as Bachi mentioned, uh, Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia recently commissioned a population study to help identify um, the number of Jewish households in Greater Philadelphia, as well as trends and behaviors around Jewish engagement, um, socioeconomic characteristics, demographic information, um, poverty, health, access to care, a whole bunch of different topics. Um, every large city Jewish Federation conducts one of these population studies approximately every 10 years. Um, and our results were just released this past February. Before I talk a little bit about the data and how it relates to um, the population of Jews of color, I wanna talk about the methodology a little bit, which kind of relates to the articles um, that Batia had mentioned. For our study, we changed our methodology from what we used in 2009. We moved from a random digit dial that relied heavily on a list-based sample as well as a list of quote unquote distinctive Jewish surnames, um, which was we identified to be a fairly problematic methodology in that it wasn't necessarily going to represent um, the community as we really think it is. Um, it's going to undercount individuals who are not engaged in agencies, who are not found on lists. Um, since it was random digit dial, and did not utilize cell phones. Um, it would not necessarily capture households that may be um, low income. Um, there are a lot of problems that we found with that methodology. So for 2019, we switched to what's called an addressed base sample methodology. And this ba balanced a list sample that we created in partnership with 40 agencies that serve the Jewish community as well as a sample of every potential address in the greater Philadelphia area as provided by the US Postal Service. So both samples um, had a chance of being selected. Both frames had a chance of being selected for our sample. Overall, we collected over 2000 surveys. People could take the survey either by web, by paper, by phone, and we offered the survey in both English and Russian. We held 17 focus groups to help provide qualitative data to support the information that we were getting through the survey. Basically, we wanted to collect as much information as possible through a robust sample that was as low barrier as possible. We, we didn't want people to feel like they couldn't take the survey because they didn't have access to the internet um, or for older adults who may have been more comfortable taking something um, on paper or over the phone. So what we found using this methodology is that the that Jews of color make up approximately 10% of the greater Philadelphia population, which is a significant change from the 5% reported in 2009. One thing I want us to keep in mind is the population's overall changed pretty significantly between the two studies. So 5% in 2009 represented um, about 5,800 households, whereas 10% in 2019 represents over 19,000 households that include someone who identifies as a Jew of color. Additionally, what we did differently 
in the 2019 survey is we modeled how we asked about race or Hispanic, Latin, or Spanish origin. We modeled that on the census questions and on the American Community Survey questions so that our data around demographics and socioeconomic characteristics would be as comparable as possible to national data and not just other Jewish community studies primarily because Jewish community studies aren't that consistent with how they ask information around race um, or Hispanic origin. So the reason that we did this study was kind of twofold. One was to identify trends in Jewish engagement and the other was to identify need in the community. What we found for um, across the board is about half of Jews in greater Philadelphia do not affiliate with any specific denomination. And this is also the case um, for households that include a Jew of color. Um, because the trend is moving towards unaffiliation, what we did is we asked additional questions to help people share how they engage with Jewish life, how they identify as being Jewish, um, and how that kind of reflects in their values and behaviors. Um, what we found for uh, Jews of color is that they're more likely to identify by ethnicity or culture rather than a religion. Only about 56% 50, of Jews of color identify as Jewish by ethnicity or culture, and 41% identify through religion. There's a small percentage, just 3%, who have Jewish parents or who were raised Jewish who do not currently identify um, as Jewish themselves, but they have um, that familial history. When we took a look at traditional Jewish behaviors like lighting Hanukkah candles, um, we found that over half of um, households that include a Jew of color participate in some sort of um, traditional Jewish activity. 56% reported lighting Hanukkah candles, 37% um, have observed Shabbat in the past year, and 36% um, uh, have participated in a Passover Seder. But beyond those kind of traditional behaviors, what we wanted to understand is um, what values are important to individuals in um, living a Jewish life. And what we found is um, households or individuals who identify as a Jew of color are more likely to list at the top of that list um, the more humanistic values. So the top five are leading an ethical and moral life, remembering the Holocaust, advocating for justice and equality in society, combating anti-Semitism, and giving and volunteering for a charity or a cause. Whereas more towards the bottom of the list are traditional Jewish behaviors, um, eating traditional Jewish foods, um, attending a synagogue, living in a Jewish neighborhood. Um, but what we found are those two sides of the spectrum are pretty consistent across all populations that we looked at. Um, they may be in a slightly different order, but they tend to fall towards those sides of the spectrum. As I mentioned before, we also wanted to really identify actual need in our community. So we took a look at um, socioeconomic characteristics, poverty, food insecurity, health care, and access to care. And what we found are households that include a Jew of color are disproportionately impacted by poverty compared to households that are just comprised of white non-Hispanic individuals. Um, they're about four times more likely to um, be living at or near poverty, which we define at, as at living at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, so 46% of households fall within that definition. Additionally, four in 10 households with a Jew of color are um, identified as at risk for food insecurity, but only about half of those households are receiving um, some sort of uh, benefit support. So like SNAP or, um, what's also known as food stamps. Um, so that discrepancy is pretty significant when we look at households just comprised of white non-Hispanic individuals. Um, it's a much, much smaller percentage between the individuals um, who are at risk for food insecurity and those um, who are receiving some sort of support. Related to poverty, um, a number of studies have indicated that there's a very close correlation between poverty and mental health. And what we found is, um, individual or households with a Jew of color are more likely to report somebody being diagnosed with a mental health condition, but 
four in 10 of the households that report a mental health condition are not receiving any kind of treatment. Related to that, about half of households reported some sort of physical health condition, um, but only 31% uh, um, are receiving some form of treatment. And about 30% more um, health, Households with a Jew of color are about 30% more likely to indicate cost as a barrier to receiving either some sort of healthcare treatment um, or a health screening. Um, so I know that was like a lot of information to just like throw at you. Um, we're going to be doing um, some data briefs over the next 12 to 18 months where we're going to be looking at some subpopulations um, or specific topic areas. Um, and one of the reports that we're going to be doing is a deeper dive into looking at the trends um, around um, Jews of color in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, we don't have an exact timeline for that report, but it is on our list. Um, so we're looking forward to looking at that data a little more um, as you heard from some of these um, highlights. Um, it's pretty, um, pretty important information. There are some really important trends that we need to identify and continue to address. So I'm happy to answer any questions, whether it's about the methodology um, or about um, any of the uh, articles that Bacia had mentioned. Um, well, I, I went to several of your presentations and you know, they're obviously very interesting, but I raised this at, at two of them. Why was there no mention of Jews of color in any of the presentations? In my mind, it rendered them invisible. That you, you know, the Federation came out to the greater Philadelphia area with this fabulous population study. Um, and there was not one slide that alluded that identified Jews of color in your findings. I was told, well, that will be for another presentation. In my mind, that's how you render a population invisible or less than. I'm really disappointed that Jews of color were not presented in the overall findings. Yeah, that's an extremely valid point. Um, and I, I don't have a particular reason why it was excluded. Um, I can tell you we are planning on doing additional reports and presentations. Um, yeah, I, I, I completely understand and it is an extremely valid point um, that it should have been included in the community presentations, um, as well as information about other underrepresented groups. So looking at, you know, LGBTQ plus communities, um, uh, those weren't included either. So yes, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions about those numbers or reflections? If I remember right, um, you said that overall the Philadelphia area is about 10% Jews of color but the, the report actually broke it down by county and Philadelphia had a higher proportion of Jews who were Jews of color, is that correct? So actually Delaware County has the high, highest proportion. When we look at um, the population of Jews of color, um, the majority of them live in Philadelphia County. So about 70% of Jews of color live in Philadelphia County. When we look at the county populations and we look at the percentage of Jews, when we look at Jews of color as a percentage of the total um, Jewish population by county, what we find is Delaware County actually has the highest proportion of Jews of color um, and Bucks County has the lowest. Um, in Delaware County, it's about 20%, um, so about one in five Jewish households include a Jew of color. In Bucks County, it's about 2%. Um, Philadelphia County on off the top of my head was 12 or 14 percent. It was kind of in the middle there. Um, so it definitely varies when we look at it county by county and that's why it's so important for um, community studies um, at the city or regional level to be tracking this information because when we look at information nationally when it um, comes to racial identity um, it's 
it's not really as representative um, as when you are looking at things as at much smaller geographic scales. So that's why, why it was important for us to break everything down by county. Um, we're additionally going to be breaking information down by Kahila or neighborhood um, and looking at specific sections within each county um, or at zip code clusters to really better understand um, information at the lowest geographic level that we can do um, without violating any kind of confidentiality for the individuals who completed the survey. And so, Ms. Arlene, I think it's very important that we, that the, the, in your next effort, you try and break the data down further. Um, because I went to the Center City Kahilo's presentation of the data and it was um, disappointing to me that there was not um, further information that really focused on Center, Center City as contrasted with the rest of the Philadelphia data. Um, and as uh, and while some of the people on this call are part of the Germantown, Mount Airy Jewish community, I think most of, certainly all the BZI, BZBI people are center city people. And, and it's very important to us that we see um, the data much more, um, much more by zip code. Yeah, absolutely. We may not be able to break it down by zip code specifically because, as I mentioned, um, there are issues with um, confidentiality for the survey respondents, but we're planning to break down Philadelphia County specifically into much smaller zip code clusters and areas. So we're able to look at Center City, we'll be able to look at South Philly, West Philly, Northwest Philly, Northeast Philly. I know the focus is Philadelphia and that, and that makes sense in terms of the study, but do you, will you, and I know this, you said the methodology may be different in other, in other communities, but is, do you ever look at and do a comparison to perhaps like cities or, you know, other Northeastern cities to see if there are any common trends? I think if you homogenize the whole country, that's a little bit different because, you know, you're going to lose some of the perhaps trends that you're going to find in, in larger cities whether it be New York or Boston or Baltimore or whatever. But do you ever do, you ever do, do that? We are planning on looking at comparisons to other cities, particularly, particularly we wanna look at Boston, um, the DC area and Baltimore. Um, not necessarily New York because New York is very much um, a larger population and they have a very significant demographic um, a different demographic profile um, than some of the slightly smaller um, of the large cities. Um, so we do plan on looking at those. Baltimore actually just released their report um, within the past, I think, two weeks, two or three weeks. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at them. Uh, Chicago is getting ready to do um, their next study. They're in the process of um, their updated study. So we're waiting for those results to come out to kind of look at what happened in, what's happening in Chicago. Um, what I can tell you is trends as they relate to interfaith um, are pretty consistent across um, the large cities. Trends um, as they relate to um, disaffiliation with particular movements um, are consistent. Um, so there are some trends that we are seeing that are similar across all of the big cities. I would just want to reflect back on what Arlene mentioned about the, the Jews of color weren't mentioned in presentations of this and relate that back to our earlier conversation about what happened at the Reform Biennial Convention. Um, I have no doubt that the group that created the survey and went out to present it had no intention to marginalize any group of people, right? They weren't trying to make anybody invisible. They weren't trying to erase anybody from the picture. And I think the same is true uh, similarly of everybody who attended the Reform Convention, that none of them went with the intention of offending anybody, of uh, mistreating anybody, being impolite to anybody in any way. Um, and when I made that comment earlier that we all have blind spots, it, you know, it's easy to look at the most, what look to us as the most egregious examples of that and say, I would never talk about somebody who's in an elevator uh, in their presence. But I think that it misses the point 
to for us to kind of point the finger at those people who are doing those egregious things if if we're committed to trying to change what is a systemic uh, uh, pervasive problem then it's for all of us to look at where does this live in me and where might I inadvertently be acting out things because I'm not aware the things you're aware of that are obvious that's great but it's how do we raise our awareness to the things that aren't obvious and as a data person uh, me professionally, I could see maybe I would overlook something like that. If I were doing a big study and presenting, summarizing the findings, I might overlook uh, pointing out the, uh, the a section about Jews of color. And now my awareness is raised and I recognize that that's such an important issue to who we are as a people and to justice in our world that it's got to be forefront in my mind now. As somebody who sits on the boards of, of both directors and trustees of the Jewish Federation, I will say that um, at each of the presentations that I heard in that context, certainly we were presented with the um, percentage of the community um, that, um, the, that, that the Jews of color constitute. I don't, we didn't get the gradations that we've heard from Lindsay today in terms of differences in perception. Um, but the numbers were presented to us and I believe some of the data with respect to the, um, uh, the increased po the comp comparative poverty rate levels and the like um, are certainly being considered um, by the, com the, the, the committees of the Federation that are trying to prioritize um, the Federation's um, expenditures in the future um, at, in response to um, the population data. So it, it's, it may not have been emphasized, um, but it's certainly being, but the data is certainly being considered and analyzed. Um, and I think that's important to say, it was important to say. Well, I think one, one other point, if I may, um, you know, Federation is a large institution and, um, you know, we talked about kind of representation and how, how do people become more aware of these issues? And I think it's about representation as well. I mean, I don't know how many people sit on Federation board, the Federation board, um, but now I'm hearing if, if uh, Jews of color represent 10% of the population in our region, is there any representation on the board, for example, of Jews of color? Because I think that's probably the best way for an institution then to be able to be cognizant of these issues and not where, whereby they don't just come up as an afterthought, but they're kind of front and center. So the real question is, you know, how representative is the board of the region, uh, of the Philadelphia region of Jews? So I, I want, those are really, these are really significant points and I hate to interrupt. I just understand that Jasmine and Akhil Bowler, who have agreed to like come on and speak about their experience at BZBI, because um, we need to understand, as we discussed earlier, every institution has their own culture, every person has their own experience, and we want to have this opportunity to hear from them. Um, but this is an important conversation and we want to continue it going forward. Lindsay, thank you so much. It was really um, beautiful work that you've been doing with the population study. Um, and I really appreciate the attention you've given to the entire community. So, and please feel free to stay on continue the call. Jasmine and Akhil, would you, would you be willing to share some of your experience? Jasmine and Akhil were both very generous with their time um, in conversation with me earlier um, last week. Sure. We're, uh, we're in the same house on two different devices. So I think we're going to join on my You want to turn your volume down? Hi. Hey, everyone. Good to see you guys. Um, our experience has been fairly good, I think, inside of 
to be more specific, I think inside of the religious Jewish community, um, socially mine has been pretty good as well because I'm a business owner and and uh, I've been pretty good, me personally. And uh, you know, we discussed with you. I think that our biggest challenges have come from more secular Jews when we present ourselves to be religious Jews. And I think, I think that's been our biggest challenge in the, for me in the workplace when I take off uh, to observe holidays or for Shabbat, you know, I'll kind of get the, um, the fuzzy eyeball from some of my non-religious Jewish, you know, business associates. But other than that, we've been we've been fortunate, I think, in our experience. We've been pretty good. Uh, BZBI has been great, you know. Uh, and like I had mentioned to you, we don't we don't necessarily shul hop, so we can't speak to other communities. But in the center city community, I'll say specifically because our our relationships do overlap with different different shuls from Mikvah Israel to Mekor and uh, Rodef and some of the other shuls. Our experience has been pretty good, personally. We haven't, we haven't experienced uh, outright discrimination. Do you agree? I agree. <laughs> and, I, and I have to say that's just such a relief after reading Maragad's piece to know that somebody has had it a good experience in the community. It was, it was really very heartening to hear. Les and Eve, did you want to share? I wanted to say that fit with what I was telling you the other day, um, that my observation from, from my observation from 40 years ago was that it was people who were less observant uh, who tended to view Judaism just as a hereditary culture, who therefore had these blind spots about other people who were real Jews. And the people who were more religious or more observant, let's say, were way more accepting and way more uh, normal about you know, all different kinds of Jews. And it's really interesting. And, and I know that a lot of reformed Jews are, are, who are you, you know, active in their community and everything are appalled to hear this, but that it was mainly unaffiliated or loosely, slightly affiliated, not pretty non-observant people who made the weirdest comments about like real Jews versus not real Jews and that kind of nonsense. Uh, I don't want to cause any like uh, specific disruption, but I want to I want to be honest about my experience. Last week, I didn't I felt more out from this specific conversation in this specific group, being a person who is looking to raise Jewish children. Someone last week in this group said, "Well, maybe this conversation was more for um, Jews and, and the conversation between them." And although. I am not, haven't converted a religion. I, I am educating raising Jewish children. So before I think people give themselves a pat on the back that this, this group has been accepting, I left this group yet last week disconcerted, feeling offended, and feeling outcast from even having this conversation. I was not necessarily sure if I was going to join this conversation this week. But when I heard there may be some Jews of color, I said, okay, well, this is the things that my children, the people that my children will experience for me being a part of that. Being a, a full Philadelphia resident, resident my entire life, um, I, I just want to point that out. So before we all sit and pat ourselves on the back, I felt so outcast leaving this group last week um, and so offended. <laughs> so I really want to. <laughs> Um, before we move forward and say, I'm so happy that everybody feels accepted in this group because I, last week that was not my experience. I left really, really hurt. Sorry you had that experience last week, Tashel. I know that that was certainly not anyone's intention. 
uh, and I, but I still want to speak about intentions versus impact because it was very impactful. Um, I started looking, I was, before I came to this group, I started, this was sent, this group was sent to me. I'm not necessarily a part of the specific greater Philadelphia community. Um, I do have a rabbi from an interfaith network, um, but was given this information by a friend of mine who is Jewish that we interact very often. And we talk about Jewish issues and black issues and all kinds of issues. Um, but the impact was different from the intent. And I think in what David was talking about, sometimes we don't intend to do these things. We don't intend to outcast people, but we then do. Um, so I just really want to put that front and center before we move forward and pat ourselves on the back and say the Jewish, the religious Jewish community has been great because that has not been my experience with all the Jews that I've experienced with both in college and in life and even, even in this group. So I really, I, I would love for Pete to be able to not necessarily revisit that, but also put that in the front of people's minds as we're having these conversations. And, and as much as I am delighted that there have been some positive experiences, if you have an opportunity to uh, listen to one of Yekilah McCoy's presentations, um, who uh, she speaks often, you can find her uh, in conversation at the, if you go to the B'nai Jeshurun website, the synagogue in New York, they recently did a series of conversations on racism, um, more frontal panel discussions-ish. Uh, and she speaks about her experience in yeshiva as a little girl. And um, she had some very negative experiences in the, in the very traditional Orthodox setting. And as we, refer, we reflected a number of times, the institutions have their own cultures. And, it, uh, and it's hard to know what you're going to encounter. And again, learning from every encounter and coming to a place where you understand um, what has come before and what needs to change is what we're all looking for. Um, what we haven't done in these conversations yet, as they were designed to be a more internal discussion and then a more historical discussion, was to talk about where we go from here. And as we've said repeatedly, these are just the beginnings of conversations. They're not, uh, they're not sufficient uh, and they're not where we want to be. They're just an opportunity to reflect and to consider what's next. Um, and I would love to hear suggestions uh, about what we should be working on next. The, there are the things that were discussed at the very beginning of this call. Uh, next week, uh, Chad Lassiter, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, is going to be joining us. We'll be talking for a little bit and we'll have an opportunity to ask him questions on racism, on anti-Semitism, and the state of hate and bigotry in Pennsylvania. Um, and he has participated in a number of these panels and he is just a lovely person in addition to being extremely knowledgeable and passionate and compassionate. Um, we talked to Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Krasner at BZBI about working on a dialogue group developing a relationship between the BZBI community and a, uh, maybe a church community of color or some other individuals of color. Um, another idea that we've talked to, which is easy, right? Rebecca, um, Robin Burstein from ADL was saying that she'd be willing to engage and talk about how to, to bring people into dialogue, which is uh, a significant and important move forward, but it also requires a lot of commitment and careful planning. Um, so we'll be talking with her and following up on that. I'm going to suggest book groups are one way with that, that word proximity that we talked about the first time, the idea that we really need to understand and we can't understand unless we really engage. Um, there are books like this one, right? it's The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. Um, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission will be bringing Richard Rothstein into a conference that they are co-sponsoring with HUD in the fall. So I'm talking to Chad about, I, I don't know how his agreement works, if we will be able to also 
um, ask Richard Rothstein to speak to our community, but as he's coming to town, it's an opportunity to read the book, understand the ways that issues and policies are are intrinsically and explicitly racist. It's a it's in, it's important and horrifying. Um, the Human Relations Commission is also bringing the author of White Fragility to town, so it's an occasion to read that book as well. And those are those are discussions that we can have that are a little easier as a logistical lift. Um, I'm going to read this list that I had hoped to share on screen, but that won't be possible. It is in the um, research packet you got when you registered for this. Um, these conversations. The cover of the book looks like that. It's Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, and I'm going to read a list he has of ways to be an anti-racist. And again, I apologize for not being able to share it on the screen. Admit racial inequity is a problem of bad policy, not bad people. Identify racial inequity in all its intersections and manifestations. Investigate and uncover the racist policies causing racial inequity. Invent or find anti-racist policy that can eliminate racial inequity. Figure out who or what group has the power to institute anti-racist policy. Disseminate and educate about the uncovered racist policy and anti-racist policy. Deploy anti-racist power to compel or drive from power the unsympathetic racist policymakers in order to institute the anti-racist policy. Monitor closely to ensure the anti-racist poli the, the anti -racist policy reduces and eliminates racial inequity. When policies fail, do not blame the people. Start over and seek out more effective anti-racist treatments until they work. Monitor closely to prevent new racist policies from being instituted. Um, that's one list. I'm sure there are others. Are there some suggestions that people would like us to pursue going forward? Well, can I just respond to what um, Tai Chell had said? Because it, I was on the, uh, the webinar last week and it, it is very upsetting to hear her response. And I think that there's no better way to learn than, I mean, we all participated in a group and we're getting feedback now and i think it's important to hear that feedback and i know there's not time you know to hear the specifics but i'm wondering if that could be shared with you and if you could share it with us because you know it's 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 a learn it's a moment of of, of learning in terms of or or ha maybe our we have to heighten our own sensitivity about what's being said or how it's being said or, or, or whatever. And I just feel like I'd, like I'd like more feedback about that experience because I don't think we should just dismiss it. I think it was obviously hurtful and I wanna know more about what part of that was hurtful. So okay. to the extent that you can do that, that would be helpful. So we can have that conversation now. Uh, one of the things that I was going to say also about how to move forward um, kind of goes into what Sandy was talking about um, in general was is not just to take the people who have written the books or who have um, presented the facts, but having those conversations um, intergroup dialogue or with other groups and not just from a prestige perspective. I think we often look at people who have taken time to write books or have had the time to write books, but there are people with great, I think great knowledge often who don't always have those kinds of luxuries to be able to sit, write a book, get it published, all of those things. So I think taking some um, conversation from people who have been impacted um, that are not necessarily people who have written books as well. So I think both end could be part of a, a good education. One of the things I learned um, in my master's program was to not just look at the authors that my professors presented to me, 
but go out and speak to people who had just the experience who may not necessarily have had the most eloquent words even. And I think that's something as uh, it, I'm not gonna, I can't speak for everybody in this group, but for most people who have had um, some type of formal college education, we tend to do, we tend to look to authors, research statistics without looking to the people who just experience on the ground. We research them without considering them. We talk about them without engaging with them specifically. We take their, we take the things that their experiences and quantify them um, or qualify them without uh, engaging with what is actually happening to fight, to enhance our own knowledge. So I, th I think that that's uh, really important. Um, some of what happened, I think, uh, I um, someone asked me in, in a private chat if, or said, stated that this group or the conversations were going to be just or more historical than uh, conversational or met as a background. And of course, there's always background to be had, but what are the conversations? We Are we studying the history of racism between Jews and Blacks? Are we, are we trying to create community between those? Are we talking about both? What are we, what, are, what is it doing? When this was sent to me, I thought, oh, this will be a great conversation. I'm entering into an interfaith marriage and having, and gonna raise Jewish children and committed to that with the partner that I have, um, but to think about what the conversation is because there was a lot of historical background last week and a lot of it was presented in what I took from it was presented as um, the things that blacks have done to, to Jews. And I think Bata, you specifically said, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't find more information on how racist Jews have been. Um, and that was a, a point of offense to me because I experience it but we were only talking about it from blacks to Jews and to sit in a group full of Jews and only hear about um, the things that blacks have done to Jews was like, okay, but where's the conversation about how we can come together, how we can move forward, how things have happened on both sides, how, uh, you know, what we can do. And then the other, I think, portion is to hear that um, because a group, Black Lives Matter, made some statements that people didn't like, people were, are, concerned about or or unwilling or are able to let go of how they want to move forward with with uh advocating for black lives whether it's inside of black lives matter or outside of i think a couple people also spoke to that but um people saying well that was so disconcerting that what black lives matter said had to say about um israel and palestine that yeah i don't know how i can move forward i don't know it really hurt me and i don't know what to do with that more than that was, that was concerning. We should talk about that and then what we're also doing. Um, we're talking about the relationship uh, with Jews and Blacks right now. And, you know, I'm not, I, of course, not everything can be solved in an hour and a half, um, but to really talk about what we can do versus just what has happened. It's, this is the third week of this conversation and we're just having a little bit of conversation about where to go from here. I think most people in this group know some form of what has happened between those two communities. I have only been in a relationship with a Jewish person for seven years, and I know a lot of those things because I invest some time to think about them. So where are we going? Are we just going to keep talking about what has happened or to whom and why we can let it go? If I only thought about what has happened to Black people and not Jewish people, then I would be doing my partner a disservice or someone that I know a disservice because before I met and was in a relationship with him, I had Jewish friends, so. So let me reflect that what I apologize for was if the balance of the text that I selected seemed off because the texts were meant to reflect both the positive and negative aspects of the relationship on both sides the ways in which the, the and again, the dichotomy between the blacks and the Jews is not accurate. It is a general broad brush approach, um, but it was meant to reflect the positive, dedicated, real support that members of each community and institutions of each community have shown to one, other, one another throughout American history. Can I it was also, Right there. It was also meant to be a chance to look at the tensions in the relationships on both sides 
between the Black and Jewish communities and individuals in the Black and Jewish communities throughout history. And those tensions, from what I could see, are pretty much the same as they've always been, as well as the commitment and the support. Very, you know, very grounded in the similar issues throughout the history of the United States. Um, so if there is some way that I was off in my balance of presenting those, I'm truly sorry. The conversation was meant to be historical, right? The first conversation was meant to be internal, and the second was meant to be historical so that we can understand, first of all, so that we can understand where the stress points and the tensions are, because we don't want to pretend that the relationships as always, have always been perfect. Because if we pretend that, then, then we're not going to be able to be sincere and real in our relationships to other people. Um, Acha, can I just appreciate all the thought that you put into putting this um, program together and to choosing the materials you chose to present? I mean, I think that was a bold thing to do to bring the program and to present those materials knowing that they were imperfect and incomplete. And Taishel, I want to really appreciate your speaking up because I think what you're offering all of us is a gift that's not easy to come by which is you're taking the risk to speak up honestly about something that was painful to you in an environment where you don't know how it's going to be received. And I think if those of us are, are most of us are on this call because we don't want to be part of a racist system and we don't want to be um, unconsciously perpetuating the racist um, ideologies that we grew up around and internalized without intending to, then we're naturally going to have a reaction. Anytime we hear of something, it's going to be defensive. That's certainly how I felt when you were talking about, oh my God, I feel so bad that I didn't notice that and I didn't speak up about it and everything. But rather than if we really want to be able to change and we want to be able to learn, we have to look at that, what you shared with us as a learning opportunity, not to defend and explain why we did what we did, but to just listen and hear how it was received by you and then be able to reflect later on what can we learn from it and what can we do different. So I learned a lot of that from reading um, uh, Robin D'Angelo's book about white fragility um, and just how much that in first instinct is going to be to be defensive and how we got to get past that if we actually want to learn and, and make change. So thank you. Thank you, David. Um, it's, and I, I'm Barbara. I, I never really introduced myself. I'm Arlene's partner. And um, I just wanted to, to add two things. I, I, I've come to this kind of work because both she and I are members of a social justice policy group at Knesset Israel. And we started book discussion groups um, as a way to kind of give people a, a, a common grounding in lots of the issues that kind of uh, swirl around us today. And I, I think you had mentioned earlier about you, what can we do going forward? And I think that kind of discussion can really end up being very helpful um, to kind of bring it back a little bit to the conversation that we've just had. I think I, I kind of um, felt a little bit of what Taishel was feeling last week. And one of the things that jumped out at me was in terms of um, the discussion of Walter White. Um, I knew Walter White was part of the NAACP, but I didn't know anything about him. It just so happens that I'm reading um, Abraham Kindy's first book, which is called Stamp from the Beginning. Um, and he goes in at length about who Walter White was. First of all, they start off by saying he was a blonde haired, blue eyed guy who um, chose to identify as black. He's like the great grandson of President Harrison. So that's who this man was. But from Kendi's point of view, he was an assimilationist most, more than anything. And the way he's framed it as assimilationists believe that just by conducting yourself in a certain way, you will break down prejudice, you will overcome it. And I, I think that when Kendi's moving on to ideas about anti-racism, the point is that that kind of assimilationist ethos does not always work. So I thought that the, 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 the excerpt that from the letter that he was writing was really coming from the perspective of an assimilationist, that he would have said the same thing regardless of whether the person was Jewish or some, some other art group, including another, uh, another person of African descent. So I, I think that sometimes these things end up being real landmines. I think I used that phrase the first time I kind of <laughs> jumped in and crashed the, the, the session two, two sessions ago, when there is not a lot of context. 
and the more context we can give ourselves to understanding, then the better off we are to, to really understanding um, and then to seek to be understood. I want to be honest, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, I want to be honest to say it wasn't the just the, um, the, the material that was presented. Honestly, I think, um, and I can talk with you offline, Bata, if, if you'd like, or if, you know, if you keep going. Um, I also think it was the, it was the defensiveness and the retort when I talked about some of the, the, um, the, the material that was presented, it was the retort of, I'm sorry, I didn't find more things, uh, so more racist things Jews have said. It was more the retort than the information. Um, I'm sorry, that was sincere. That was, that was not a defensive statement. That was not a sarcastic statement. That was a sincere statement. If I got the balance wrong and how I chose these materials, my, if, if you read through books, because what I'm trying to do is to sum up an endless books, right? Right? These are, these are really thick books. Right. And I'm just trying to get them down. Somebody said there were 11 pages. That's much too much material. I was trying to get these endless books down into just a few emblematic texts. And when I said, I'm sorry if I didn't find more racist Jews, I meant that, that truly sincerely. If I got the balance wrong and I in some way neglected to reflect the racism in the Jewish community, I'm sorry. That, I did, that wasn't defensive. That was real. Okay. All right. It, ca it came right before the, a different conversation that someone already offline and said uh, they would love to talk about because they said it to me, they said it. Um, so those couple together came off very um, disconcerting. But I, it, I think just- can, can I actually say one more thing that I worry that I was misheard? But um, I, I, was, I was concerned that you heard me as criticizing MLK, MLK's response as having a rebuke to the Jewish community. I actually thought, it was a beautifully written speech because I think there is an appropriate rebuke of the Jewish community. And I thought it was such a beautiful speech because if you heard it, you would never know it was there unless you were looking for it. And maybe- No, I definitely heard that. I heard that, that it was more of a call to action and that's why I framed it as such. I thought it was a call to action. I think- I think it is. I yes. think it absolutely is. I mean, and then also, it wasn't just that, it was even, you know, and I know I, I saw you try to cut off someone when they were speaking um, earlier for good reason, because they were say, uh, someone said, well, when I encounter Blacks, they're always angry. And it was like, uh, so I tried to frame that. It's not anger, it's ambivalence, it's, un, it's not being sure. I will say today, as I'm walking around where I, or yesterday, as I was walking around where I live, I have to walk with dual consciousness and think about if they're going to encounter me and think I'm not in the right place because I'm the only black face out here. Are they going to be friendly and say hello? So I, I was trying to frame that for the person who said it last week, that they're always angry. They're either nice or they're angry. It was like, well, that, that like someone said, that can be anybody, but then also it's ambivalence. You're just not sure. So I, I I, I saw, I mean, that was, that, that happened at the beginning and I saw you try to curb that um, and, and move the conversation along. But then I also, um, and I, and I did hear it you, in your voice or in your conversation that it was a call to action um, and particularly specifically needed to be a call to action to Jews. It's not, I'm, I'm not, I don't walk around just thinking, oh, well, this is terrible, but how can we move forward? What are we doing in, in, in that context? So thank you. So this is, again, just the beginning of a longer conversation and a longer process. And I'm glad that we've, we've engaged in starting. Right now we have to figure out what comes next. And I think the answer is everything. And, um, I don't think there is anything that we can engage that we can't acknowledge has an element of racism as part of the conversation. Um, and as we try to figure out what the next steps are, um, reflecting on the role that race plays in our society and in every policy and every 
challenge our society faces is a place to start the conversation. Um, so I thank you all. And you should, I don't know if you all have my email address, but we'll make sure that goes out to everyone um, along with the, the links to today's texts that you didn't get to see. Um, thank you. And I look forward to being in touch with everyone and engaged going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Bhatia. Thank you, Bhatia. Thank you, Bhatia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.